I'd like to direct your attention to our next event, which is going to be Patricia Sabella, who's going to be presenting on her new book on Mexican immigration. So you'll not only have a chance to buy it and get it signed by her, but also to hear um, what's in it. And so we hope that you'll join us on April 19th, same time, 4 to 5.30. So we're changing that up a little bit this year. Um, and I'd like to invite you all now to join us after the talk in a reception in our parlor, um, where we'll have food and the opportunity to continue. It's a great conversation that our guest, who I'm proud to introduce, um, Dr. Manuel Pastor, who's a professor of American Studies and Ethnicity and Geography at the University of Southern California. He's also director of, he's the super director, he's the Program for Environmental and Regional Equ Equity at USC and of the Center for the Study of Immigrant in Integration. He was also the founder of the Center for Justice, Tolerance, and Community at UC Santa Cruz. Um, he's received fellowships from pretty much every foundation, or grants from every <laughs> foundation you possibly, you have a small list here, but um, I think if a foundation exists, they have given them all money in the last few years. And the reason they have is because he really is a person who I think exemplifies how do you bridge the academy and the community and make academic work meaningful through political practice and how to inform political practice through academic work. And um, he received his bachelor's degree in economics and creative writing from UC Santa Cruz, and I think that ability to combine things that usually aren't brought together, right? Most economists are not creative writers, I would say, as a general principle, um, I think informs all of his work. So I think he's just an exceptional example of how to make a difference um, with intellectual work and political practice, and we're proud to have him here as part of our series. So welcome on Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, and really glad to uh, be here. I think the last time I uh, spoke in this environment was over at the Center for Latin American Studies speaking about the Mexican peso crisis, uh, which of course then prompted a lot of immigration and another research topic that I'm talking about today. So glad to be here. Uh, thanks for the mic. Uh, I, my voice may break in and out a little bit when I'm speaking. Uh, some of you who know me well know that I have a voice disorder, which uh, actually gets treated every month with Botox, uh, because that's how we treat everything in Los Angeles, uh, <laughs> Botox. So uh, what I want to talk today a little bit about is uh, I'm going to move to uh, what I think is the part that was the most exciting, which is some new data on uh, naturalization trends. Uh, but what I want to talk about to kind of get there is talk a little bit about some of the demographic realities that are going on in California right now. Uh, and in particular, what's changing about immigration into California and the immigrant or foreign-born community in California. I want to then talk a little bit about uh, diversity and difference. Uh, that is, that we tend to have a kind of uniform nation, a uh, notion, I'm sorry, of what we uh, think is, uh, are the, is the immigrant community. And I want to try to complicate that uh, a little bit for you, or as academics would say, problematize because we academics like to take things that are nouns, turn them into verbs, uh, <laughs> make them multisyllabic and sound intellectual. Uh, so then I'm gonna talk a little bit about whether or not diversity is, whether or not integration is uh, occurring, and I'll talk a little bit about that term in a second, and then talk a little bit about naturalization as one marker and driver of political change in the future, and some really unique data that I think may be useful uh, to community organizations and others on this topic. Um, and I think I said that all rather rapidly, uh, because I'm Cuban, uh, which means we speak very fast, and if I was doing this in Spanish, a lot of you would appreciate it. Uh, others of you would say, my God, uh, Spanish does not have S's or N's, because uh, that's how Cubans speak Spanish. So, uh, we actually have a particular definition of immigrant integration that we've used in our Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration, in which we define immigrant integration as economic mobility for, civic participation by, and receiving society openness to, immigrants. Uh, that is a uh, definition that we've come to uh, out, of, out of a series of conversations with a number of different stakeholders. Uh, all of those are uh, measurable, economic mobility, civic participation, and in fact receiving society openness too. Uh, they are two-way because they require some responsibility on the part of the receiving society uh, as well as on the part of immigrants, and they are not tied into the question of cultural assimilation. So when we say immigrant integration, we're focusing in on how people are doing economically, what their participation mechanisms are, and not whether or not they've uh, melded into a US society, but really, in part, how they transform it. Now, this is a particularly important topic for California for a very particular set of reasons. Uh, and the particular set of reasons is that while immigrants and the number of immigrants are actually growing uh, in the United States right now, uh, 
In fact, the number of immigrants are stabilizing and the share is falling in California and has been falling for the last couple of years uh, in Los Angeles. This is not what most people think. This graph uh, shows you the share of all U.S. immigrants uh, that are in California or that were in Los Angeles. And it's what you can see is the share that were in California peaked uh, in 1990 and has actually been on the decline uh, since. That is, immigrants are spreading out all over the rest of the country, uh, something that we're quite familiar with. But what people are, I think, a little bit less familiar with is what I just mentioned, which is that the share of the foreign born is actually beginning to cusp uh, in California, and it's been on the decline for the last two or three years in Los <coughs> Angeles. The share of foreign born is declining in Los Angeles. And in fact, um, a couple of other things that are pretty interesting about this, when you look at the census data between 2000 and 2010, uh, the Latino population between 2000 and 2010 grew uh, by 43%. Uh, the API, US wide, the Asian Pacific Islander population grew by 43%, a remarkable coincidence. The African American population grew by 11%, uh, the non Hispanic white population by 1%. 43%, 1%. Most of the US population, what do they think is driving at 43%? Immigration. They're wrong. Uh, immigration into the United States has been tapering off, particularly over the last two or three years. It's not tapering off simply because of increased border enforcement or a slower economy. It's tapering off because of lower fertility in Mexico, which has gone from over five children per woman to just about 2.1, very close to the U.S. rate of 1.7. So less fertility push factors. And the U.S. economy is actually doing worse relative to the Mexican economy than it's been doing in the past and many other Latin American economies as well. So we're not going to get as much immigration in the future. And <coughs> California sort of shows this by the share of our foreign born declining over time. In fact, here's one really interesting statistic. As you can tell, I'm a stat nerd. Of the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the United States, and a metro area is something like Denver, or the Bay Area, or uh, Utah, it's, uh, Salt Lake City, or uh, Phoenix, or Miami. Of the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the United States, what metro area in the United States is the only metro area, a big one, 100 largest, that did not see an increase in the number of Hispanic children between 2000 and 2010? <coughs> Los Angeles, <laughs> right? Is that the public's vision? No. Los Angeles, right? So Los Angeles is on the decline and population is stabilizing, share is stabilizing as well. California also has amongst the most uh, uh, settled of immigrant populations. This is the states in the United States uh, aligned on the uh, horizontal axis by the share of immigrants who arrived more than 10 years ago, so a relatively settled population. Um, so the only state that has a more settled immigrant population than California is Vermont. <laughs> and that's because they have like two immigrants, right? And, and, uh, those guys arrived. Those guys arrived a long time ago. Uh, so we have a very settled immigrant population, uh, and in fact, uh, the undocumented population, for example, in Los Angeles County, of the undocumented population, uh, more than half of them arrived more than 12 years ago. Okay? So very settled population. The big drivers for the Latino population growth now are the uh, second generation. We're going to focus in on the immigrants in just a second. Um, so given the sheer size of the population, immigrants, however, are an increasingly important part of the California economy with Los Angeles uh, leading the way. Uh, this is the immigrant share of employment. And you can. this is for 1980 to 2007-2009. Those of you who are familiar with the data uh, will know that uh, what uh, happened is that we were able at the decennial years previously to use the uh, public use microdata sample, but then recently that doesn't, they do not do a short or a long form uh, for the 2010 census. That's been replaced with the American Community Survey, which is done every year. And so if you want to take a look, it's really convenient. You can look at change now on an annual basis, but if you want to have large enough samples to have a same degree of reliability as from the earlier public use microdata sample, you have to pool multiple years. So here we're pooling 2007, 2009. But you can see that basically what the data tells you is that for California and for Los Angeles, that the immigrant share of employment has been going up uh, over time. 
so that, for example, in 1980, about one quarter of the workforce in Los Angeles County was immigrant. Uh, by the 2007-2009, that's nearly half of the uh, workforce is uh, immigrant. So very important uh, immigrants to the uh, economy. Uh, this shows you the industries that immigrants are in, again, for Los Angeles. Very high share in uh, construction, uh, other kinds of services. Manufacturing, interesting thing is that probably one third of our manufacturing employment is uh, undocumented, uh, which is pretty significant. Uh, wholesale trade, uh, basically hoteling, other kind of accommodations. Uh, so very high share of immigrants in particular occupations, very high share uh, in uh, particular parts of the economy. And immigrants have a high share of household income as well, although not as high a share as they do of employment. But you can see that in 79, uh, their share of household income in California was 14%, in Los Angeles County, 20%. Uh, now, in the most current period, about one quarter of household income is uh, held by households with at least one immigrant, with an immigrant householder, head of household, and about three quarters, or I'm sorry, about 34 percent of the uh, household uh, income in Los Angeles County. So, that's a very big population. It's a more settled population. The drivers of population growth are increasingly uh, the natural births to the kids of immigrants. So, for example, in Los Angeles County, two-thirds of our uh, children have at least one immigrant parent. Ninety percent of those kids are U.S. born, not going anywhere. Um, so, that's what it looks like uh, generally. Very important then to consider how the immigrants are doing, and that means a little bit about understanding also uh, the changing uh, immigrant uh, population. Um, so. We first have to understand the sort of country of origin diversity of our immigrants. So this is again for Los Angeles County, and these are for the longer term immigrants, so people who've been in the country for more than 30 years. Uh, about 40% of them are Mexican. So here's the question. For the immigrants who've been in the country less than 10 years in Los Angeles County, so recent immigrants, what percent of recent immigrants into Los Angeles County do you think are Mexican? Recent immigrants. It's a good guess. Others? I'll take 35. 35, okay. <laughs> what do you think the popular imagination is? Um, 90. 90. I think it's like 150, right? Yeah. <laughs> and people think basically super Mexicans cross the border, right? Going, I come from more than one, right? Um, arrive, so in. So, the figure is very close to uh, what uh, was guessed over here. Uh, it's a little bit less than a third of recent immigrants are Mexican. Uh, there's a large group of other Latin Americans, Filipinos, Chinese, Guatemalans, Salvadorans, uh, Koreans, Armenians, etc. Um, so very diverse immigrant population, and this is true of uh, California as well. Um, and very diverse population in terms of uh, educational attainment. So when you look at, uh, for example, U.S. born whites, uh, less than 3% failed to complete high school, who are of working age population, 25 to 64, uh, uh, have less than high school. These folks uh, uh, are at least high school grads, some college, associate's degree, 49% of the workforce actually has a, uh, a bachelor's degree. That's LA County. You can see that that's lower for a bachelor's degree for African Americans higher failure to complete high school. U.S. born Latinos, very high rates to failure to complete high school, lower in terms of uh, bachelor's degree. For immigrant Latinos, it's about 36% have less than a high school degree, 7% uh, have a bachelor's degree. The uh, U.S. born and uh, foreign born API population actually have much higher uh, bachelor's degree attainments uh, than the uh, U.S. born white population. Although you can see there's an immigrant population of immigrant APIs who have less than high school degree. It's a kind of bifurcated immigrant uh, uh, population. So at the same time, we've got a population that has a very high level of folks who do not have a high school degree. About 40% of the folks between the ages of 25 and 64 with a doctor degree in California are immigrants, right? Just higher than their share of the workforce. So, bifurcated in terms of occupying the low ends of the educational level and skill level, but also occupying 
with a high end of the educational level as well. I'm going to shift because it's warm in here to my dress t shirt. Thank you. Business <laughs> casual. Um, so, the other thing that we need to be aware of, and this is some great work that uh, Irene's been doing with Shannon and a number of others, though I'll show this just for LA County, is the geographic relocation of our immigrant community. There's been a tendency to think of our immigrant communities as being located in traditional portals like the Mission Area here in the Bay Area or Westlake or East LA Boyle Heights uh, in Los Angeles. And that's what it looked like indeed in 1980. These are uh, the picture of 1980 for Los Angeles County. And you can see here that uh, the darker areas had a higher percent immigrant. And those were the central city areas uh, spilling from downtown into East Los Angeles, Boyle Heights, and then right in here into the Vernon area as well. And that's really where a lot of our immigrants were in 1980. One of the things that's changed spatially <coughs> in the year 2005 to 2009, and I'll do that again because that kind of looks so cool when it fades, <laughs> uh, is the moving into suburban areas, right? So this is the San Gabriel Valley, which has become very immigrant, uh, both immigrant and Latino in places like El Monte and La Puente, uh, but also very Asian immigrant uh, in Monterey Park uh, and uh, other places. Down here is Roland Heights, if you know that area well. It's very Korean. In fact, it's a lot more Korean than Koreatown, which actually happens to be Latino town. Although uh, it's actually, uh, uh, Koreatown's about 80% Latino, mostly Korean businesses, great place to do karaoke. Um, if you could sing better than I can. Uh, the San Fernando Valley, very heavy Latino presence. Uh, up here in Sun Valley, where Adrián is from, this is basically his family and many of their relatives moved in here and completely, <laughs> completely changed the dynamic uh, up into Bitcoin, etc. So the whole Valley Girl thing has become something very different. Uh, but, uh, and then down here into uh, Orange County, etc. So very, the suburbanization of immigrants is very important. Now, what's interesting about this suburbanization is it does not fit the traditional spatial assimilation model of Douglas Massey, in which the immigrants arrive in the traditional setting areas, and then as they become more settled over time, move onward. That still does go on. If you look at the uh, pace over time, those of you who know LA will know what I'm saying is, you know, people arrive in Boyle Heights, then they move up to Lincoln Heights, right? <coughs> then they move into Tel Monte, and finally they land in Whittier, right? Uh, you know, Whittier is the place where all Latinos want to settle, right? Uh, so uh, that still that pattern still goes on, but what's gone on is that increasingly there's a movement increasingly simply into uh, the suburban areas. This is happening in many metro areas, including here in the Bay Area. It's also happening in places like Atlanta as well. Um, so very different geographic uh, uh, patterns. Another geographic pattern is the increasing interpenetration of uh, immigrant and African-American communities. Don't have the graphs on that right now, but we've done some reports on this as well. Um, so what is uh, going on that remains continuous is that immigration is occurring uh, in the United, uh, immigrant integration is occurring in the United States, although frequently it's masked. And it's masked because uh, one of the things that's happening is what our good colleague uh, Daniel Myers calls the Peter Pan fallacy. And I grew up in a house myself uh, where we only had two books. Um, we had, I remember them well actually. One was the autobiography of Hedy Lamar, and the other was the autobiography of Sammy Davis Jr., mm -hmm. which was called Yes, I Can. And I think I've read that book more than anyone in America, including Sammy, who purportedly wrote it. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we didn't ever have like Peter Pan, but from what I'm told, correct me, Peter Pan never gets old. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, so what Dow says is that people think about immigrants uh, like Peter Pan. This guy you're seeing in front of Home Depot is the same guy who was there 10 years ago, and he'll be here 10 years from now, right? Uh, but in fact, people change over time, right? And the question is, how are people doing over time? And what's interesting, this is income by recency of migration in Los Angeles County. And you can see that for the folks who migrated less than 10 years ago, their median household income is much lower than that of U.S. born whites. But for those who migrated 10 to 20, 20 to 30, uh, and those who are migrated more than 20 to 30 years ago, their household income actually starts moving in the direction of U.S. born household income. There is remaining discrimination. We can detect that in labor markets. But immigrant integration does occur over time. 
it's often masked uh, by the fact that we've got a wave of recent uh, immigrants, and it requires the right kind of public policy interventions. A lot of these folks have the benefits, like me, of decent public schools, et cetera. Uh, English language learning continues to occur over time. This is what the American Community Service, uh, American Community Survey tells us about people's uh, self-reported uh, English speaking abilities. And for the most part, people underreport how well they speak English. But you can see that for people who've been in the country, uh, the longer they've been in the country, the more uh, the share of people who speak only English, uh, who say that they speak English very well, uh, or speak English well. Uh, these are people who are born uh, in the United States. You can see that there's a big share of people actually who live down here who are U.S. born who say that they do not speak English very well. Uh, many professors encounter them in classes, right, uh, and, and wonder. Uh, but anyway, you can see that there's a pattern of people continuing to learn English, and particularly when you think about the second generation, people continuing to learn English. And then one favorite statistic uh, has to do with uh, home ownership. And one thing that's really interesting about this is that for both Los Angeles County and for the uh, California generally, long-term immigrants are more likely to buy a home than U.S. born residents. That there's something about settling in, <coughs> getting roots, etc. Again, another sign of integration. So, uh, this is a population that is now, you know, when we look and project into the future, uh, people uh, have to realize that the main driver is not uh, immigration in the future, but it's really the second generation. We have to realize that this is a very diverse population. We have to realize that immigrant integration is occurring, uh, but we also have to realize that that immigrant integration is at risk. It's at risk because unless we have the right kinds of public policies, decent investments in public schools, <coughs> including the University of California, uh, the kinds of job training programs, public transit programs, etc., that help people make that progress over time, then the progress of those uh, that generation of immigrants uh, will not happen. And if it does not happen, then what that puts at risk is also the progress of a second generation as well. So in order to do that, we need to think about increasing the political power of the current immigrants in order to be able to make sure that immigrants' needs and interests are represented in the policy arena. And that way, also guarantee that the interests and needs of that second generation are uh, put forward as well. And partly because of that, we've begun a project that looks at the question of naturalization. Um, and in looking at the question of naturalization, we have statistics that are generally available from the U.S. Office of Immigration Statistics, OIS, which is associated with the Citizenship and Immigration Services uh, portion of Homeland Security. And what OIS does is it collects information on lawful permanent residents, LPRs, the term I will now use, LPRs, lawful permanent residents, uh, basically what we generally know as green card holders. And these LPRs can be of two types, people who are new arrivals or people who adjusted their status. Most of the people who adjusted their status are people who became legalized under IRCA, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, I think it was, uh, but which allowed people from 1984 and back to be able to adjust their status, providing that they showed that they'd been in the country uh, for some period of time. Um, and what the uh, U.S. Office of Immigration Statistics does is it tracks naturalization over time. It does make the information available online, uh, but it makes the information available um, in ways that are not particularly useful. It makes the information available at a very aggregate level. Um, so it makes the information available like how many people arrived in the United States and uh, over what period of time and how many of them naturalized, but for the US as a whole. So we know that there's like 7.2 million people who are eligible to naturalize uh, in the United States that have not yet naturalized, but we don't know that much about them, right? Like where did they come from? Uh, when did they arrive, et cetera? The Office of Immigration Statistics does some of these breakdowns, sometimes on country of birth, uh, sometimes on a variety of other characteristics. The geographic uh, location that they provide is that of the initial residence, but generally they only break it down by state or by the large metropolitan area. They break it down by kind of time periods that don't necessarily make a lot of sense. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is the 
data that's available publicly um, is not as useful as it might be. This, of course, does not stop researchers, right? So what we did over the last uh, six to nine months is a, it's actually kind of interesting. First we did a conference at the, uh, at USC called uh, Which Way America? Realigning, Regrouping, and Reframing for Immigrant Integration. We brought Alejandro Mayorkas, who's the head of Citizenship and Immigration Services, to a conference that had about 400 people. He was the lunchtime keynote speaker, and he knew he was about to be grilled mm -hmm. on all the stuff they're not doing in the Obama administration, right? So he's kind of desperate to try to figure out something he could do, right? Um, and lo and behold, we wound up saying, why don't you make this data available to us, right? Uh, so that we can actually try to figure out who's naturalizing and not, and try to do something with that. So this was a pretty easy ask for him to be able to uh, say yes to. He then directed us to have a conversation with his staff. This is a kind of good side thing for the graduate students <coughs> and other researchers to know. So I don't know whether at least you were on one of the initial phone calls with the, the research staff, but the research staff were very reluctant to release the data. Uh, the reason they were reluctant to release the data was they were afraid they would be misused. Uh, and they were afraid basically who they were going to give it to. So we wound up having what I like to call nerd-to-nerd -nerd conversations, uh, where we assured them that we were just as nerdy as they were, right? And, and we were, you know, we knew the data, we were crafting this very this request that made sense and uh, all this kind of stuff. And we knew what they had to do in terms of some of the confidentiality restrictions, which I'll talk about in just a second. So uh, OIS has some data available, but it's not very well broken down. And so what we did was uh, go ahead and make a request. And the request was for the number of people who gained LPR status between 1985 and 2010. Uh, the reason for choosing 1985 is that's the first year that they think that their data is pretty reliable on location, and 1986 is when people began applying under ERCA, right? So if you had been in the country in 1984, you were eligible to apply for ERCA amnesty. If you were, like, in the country in 1984 and you couldn't figure out how to get the amnesty, I'm sorry, it was pretty easy to do, right? I mean, so almost anybody who was in the country in 1984 is being picked up by this, right? So 19, we asked it for a bunch of different time periods, 1985 to 1991, because if you look at the data, that's when the ERCA boom drops off. 1992 to uh, 1998, 1999 to 2005, and 2006 to 2010, because that's the last five years of data, and nobody in that last five-year cohort can naturalize, because they have to have been in the country for more than five years. We asked for, uh, the, for every county in the United States, or for every metro area in the United States, we wanted the top 30 sending countries for the counties and the top 60 sending countries for the CVSA. If they couldn't give us the country, we wanted them to code it up to the region that they sent from, Africa, the Caribbean, uh, 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 South America, etc. cetera. Uh, and we wanted to know whether or not the person had naturalized or not as of 2010. Does that make sense, kind of? So it's an extraordinarily, there's some limits to this database, but it's an extraordinarily rich database. Uh, by crafting this request, the Department of Homeland Security Privacy Guidelines say that when you get summary data, if you have less than three people in a cell that's that data, they have to go through a non-disclosure. But because we had so many ways that they could step up from it, they, we wound up losing less than 2% of the entire kind of migration flow into the country due to disclosure reasons. Um, and we are able to, for example, tell you how many Albanians arrived between 1985 and, you know, 1991 in Boston and how many of them naturalized, right? So it's, uh, for those of you researching Albanians, it's really a, a wealthy, rich data set. So we have two summary files. One is a county level file with top, the top 30 LPR countries. And then there's a CBSA with the top 55 LPR sending countries plus five countries of interest. Basically, four of them were, um, uh, Latin American countries so they could be grouped with the other countries in terms of outreach uh, because of Spanish. And we made a set of adjustments to this data uh, for the following, uh, the following adjustments. The first adjustment is a sad adjustment. People die, right? So immigrants who arrive in the country, not all of them survive. Uh, not everybody who was born in the country survives. So we made adjustments by taking for the 1980, for every cohort group of arrival, 
we, and this, these are new adjustments. We took, for every cohort group of arrival, we took the, uh, the immigration population that was most like that cohort um, in the census. We got their age distribution, and then we applied a mortality table to figure out how many of them would die from the people that arrived. Uh, and we did that using separate things for each one of those four arrival groups. Uh, we then applied an immigration, because people who come to the country, not everybody stays. And then there's something called derivative citizenship. Derivative citizenship generally is when your parents naturalize, you kind of naturalize along with them, uh, but you don't have to fill out any special forms. So you're not caught on the special forms that we've got data on, so we made a derivative assumption adjustment. So all of this was done so we would actually be able to, uh, it was a rather funny uh, conversation because when we were first doing the mortality adjustments, I said, did we kill enough immigrants? Uh, because we were trying to make sure that we got through the mortality, immigration, and derivative citizen adjustments very similar at an aggregate level to what US, USCIS thinks is the existing population eligible to naturalize, but being able to drive it down to a county level by the country of origin. So, a uh, couple of cautions about this data. Uh, one is that it does assume that people uh, who are in a particular uh, county are still in that same county. That's probably unlikely. It's much better for the metro areas because there's less intermetro mobility than county mobility. Uh, but I'll talk about what we're doing with it. Uh, why we think this data is important is that detailed geography means you can understand uh, basically how to launch outreach campaigns uh, that really make a difference and how to tailor them to the populations that are there. Uh, and we think it has some implications for economic vitality and political change, and I'll talk about those. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit what we've done with the data. So first, you can actually calculate um, naturalization rates, right? What are the percent of people who arrived who are naturalized? Interestingly, the group that has the lowest naturalization rate are Canadians. Those damn Canadians are too loyal to their country. Uh, they're not true Americans. <laughs> You want to provide any testimony for people? <laughs> Are you naturalized? No, my husband did this summer and I didn't. <laughs> so living proof, right? Uh, so yeah, the, the group with the lowest naturalization rate are Canadians. Uh, you know, again, pretty close attachment to the country right across the border. Uh, generally look down their noses at us uh, and also understand that they have health care and we don't, right? So why do you otherwise <laughs> here be on your own? United Kingdom is second. Mexicans have a very low rate of nationalization, which we know. And then here's a bunch of the other countries. But again, we've got this for 60 different countries in the data set in terms of aggregate level of naturalization. Um, so, but what's cool about this is that you can then figure out the, that you can take the lawful permanent residents, a trip, a trip the people who died, the people who immigrated, the derivative citizenship, subtract away the people who became citizens, and then you've got people who are eligible to naturalize. Uh, and so this is just the raw numbers of people who are eligible to naturalize. Uh, but then you can figure out where those who are eligible to naturalize who are Mexican. So a big group on the border here and in Dallas, obviously in places in California, which we'll come back to in Chicago. Uh, you can do this for El Salvador, different geography. Houston actually turns out to be important. Washington, D.C., New York. Uh, for the Philippines, you can see San Diego is actually quite important, national city. Uh, huge group that uh, eligible to naturalize, Chicago, uh, up here in the New York area as well. Uh, you can do this for folks from South Asians. Up here is uh, the Bay Area, San Jose, right? Santa Clara County, where there's pretty low rates of naturalization for the Indian immigrants. Again, here for the uh, uh, Dallas, Houston, uh, parts of the South, etc. So you can actually target campaigns. This is for Persians. Uh, but it's more than the raw data. The raw data is cool. But here's three things we've done uh, that are even cooler uh, with this data. Uh, so the first, thing, and they're actually going to weave into a story. And basically the story is, uh, to get to the end, we've really got to do stuff in Fresno. And I'll explain why in a second. So what we wanted to do was to identify regions that were underperforming <coughs> in terms of naturalization, and then consider the implications of naturalization on voting in California. So what do we do to identify underperforming regions. We constructed a little regression model, and the regression model basically understands that different countries of origin have different pro pro propensities to naturalize. So we control for the country of origin, we control for 
the cohort arrival. If you're longer in the United States, you have more of a tendency to naturalize. And we try to control for some localized civic infrastructure. We happen to know that certain states, uh, particularly California uh, and Illinois, have better immigrant infrastructure, and so they tend to do a better job at just moving people into naturalization. Uh, so it's a very simple regression model for the top uh, metro areas, I think it's like 100, we'll get to the number in a second, about 187 or so, in which we looked at the share of early arrivals, the country of origin, and the state dummies. Uh, those of you who do regression work will know that there's two happy things in this table. One is a lot of significance, right? Which is good. And second is that we're explaining 86% of the variation for the metro areas just with a simple uh, regression model. And that all the signs look appropriate. People who arrive longer have higher <coughs> rates of naturalizations. Mexicans have a lower rate of naturalization. Uh, Canadians also have a lower rate of naturalization, et cetera. Uh, and the signs on uh, California and Illinois is actually the only state. And remember, Illinois has that immigrant integration initiative where it's have passed a statewide initiative to promote naturalization immigrant integration shows up in the data. So the model actually performs pretty well. What it allows us to do is to take the predicted rate of naturalization given uh, what your area is and compare it to the actual rate. So if your actual rate is higher than your predicted rate, you're an overperformer. If your actual rate is lower than your predicted rate, you're an underperformer. Does that make sense? And so what we can do is figure out who the overperformers are and the underperformers are. By the way, my staff did this animation, not I, which is why it looks so cool. Um, and then we're able to go then from that, here are the overperformers. And they include places like uh, actually Tucson, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Los Angeles is an overperformer, Santa Ana, some other places, and then the underperformers. And the cool thing about the underperformers, by the way, here's the, some of the underperformers are Modesto, uh, Madera, and if we went a little bit up, we'd see Fresno. So this is a map in which the greener the area, the more highly overperforming it is. So it's either highly overperforming or overperforming, uh, underperforming or highly underperforming. You can see that the Chicago area is actually kind of highly overperforming, right? Really good immigrant rights infrastructure. Los Angeles actually does pretty well, as actually does the Inland Empire. Very underperforming in California, Bakersfield, Fresno, uh, Madera, Modesto, Stockton, and El Centro. Very underperforming, okay? So what's cool about this, here, here's what, I'll stop saying what's cool about this, although we're fascinated, so we think it's cool. Funders tend to want to put money into LA. I love it, right? But, it, my joke about this, another way to think about this is like if you really wanted to change the political dynamic in California, you'd not put another dollar into Berkeley because you can't get one more liberal out of this place, right? I mean, you know, anybody who's conservative and still here, they're, they're determined, right? Um, and if you wanted to get a lot of money out of naturalization, you could move the statewide vote, right, by getting more naturalization in Los Angeles, maybe. But if you really wanted to change policies, you actually want to go to the places that are underperforming, because if you go to the places that are underperforming, you can change the state legislature, and you can change the state senate to actually vote a different way. I'm going to illustrate to you why that's possible. Uh, so, the other thing we've been doing is looking at the economic benefits of naturalization to help make this argument. Uh, there's a pretty big uh, gain to naturalization. Uh, if you're an immigrant citizen, you make a lot more than a non-citizen. But a lot of that has to do with the different characteristics of what immigrants are. So we've been using a model that controls for gender, education, age, experience, uh, immigration, immigrant, uh, immig immigrant, non-immigrant, years in the United States, English language ability, what country you're from, and what part of the United States you're in, because that impacts your economic uh, performance as well. And we find that there's pretty significant returns to naturalization. So for full-time year-round workers, there's between an 8% and a 10% return to naturalization. So there's good economic reasons to pursue naturalization. Now, a uh, couple things about this and then to the, to the end. Why does economic gain to naturalization? Uh, we think they, it may be for a very interesting reason. In the current <clears throat> economic atmosphere, somebody who can prove they're a US citizen is gonna face less discrimination on the job than someone who's an immigrant, even if they have a proper green card, because there's so much worries about proper documentation. 
And so we think that's part of it. Another part of it is it turns out probably people who become U.S. citizens, even though we're controlling for U.S. capital, are more likely to make a commitment to staying in the country and therefore be investing in their own human capital and job training over time. So there's economic reasons uh, to pursue naturalization. But let me move on to the naturalization and voting. So what we tried to do uh, was to try to uh, think about uh, who's eligible to naturalize who is not yet naturalized. And this is what it looks like uh, in terms of the raw numbers. And we can actually bring it down to the sub-county level. So when you bring it down to the sub-county level, there's a lot of people eligible to naturalize in Los Angeles. This brings it down to the sub-county level. A lot of people are eligible to naturalize up through the kind of uh, Great Valley as well. Uh, and then obviously here um, in Imperial County. But the real <laughs> question is, what would that do to the voting electorate? In order to do that, what you need to do is to not use the files that are used in redistricting. Because the files that are used in redistricting have to do with the age-eligible population, just whether or not people are over the age of 18. You have to instead look at the citizens who are above the age of 18, and meaning the naturalized and U.S.-born citizens above the age of 18, and then ask, what would you add to that population if you were able to naturalize everybody? The only way to do that is to use the American Community Survey to drill into the individual answers at the county and sub-county level and ask who's above the age of 18, who's a citizen, and then use that as a base to say if we naturalize everybody who's eligible to naturalize, what would that do in terms of an addition to the electorate? Now that's a very significant number for the following reason. It turns out recent migrants currently tend to vote at rates high, as high or higher than U.S. born and uh, older immigrant populations. That has not been historically true, but it has been true in the last couple of elections because the Republicans have managed to piss off so many new immigrants, right? And so people are generally really coming to the electoral process is pretty mobilized, right, around questions. And you, you really hear this. People are naturalizing. They're really excited about voting the first time. So the voting propensities are pretty high. So if you could add these many voters and you assume that they vote as high as the current population, you're getting at a pretty good guess at what the shift in the votes would be. Does that make sense? So what's that look like? Uh, if you can look at the raw numbers, which is what this is, and this is raw numbers for the Bay Area as well. Uh, but you can also look at the LPRs who are eligible to naturalize as a share of the voting eligible population, as I've talked about it. And one of the things that you're going to notice is that um, you know, it's a big share that's less than 5% is the gray. This isn't showing up very well, but it's kind of 5% you could add to the voting population uh, through uh, Stanislaus, through Fresno, through Merced, into Madera, heading into Kern. In Kern, you actually get to, you could add, this is great, 10 to 20 percent. This is greater than 20 percent that you could add to the voting eligible population. Why is this significant? Look at a map of uh, voter registration by assembly district, uh, the percent by which Democrats exceed Republicans. So if you're really blue, uh, that's more than 6%. If you're sort of purple, uh, that means you're actually right in this area where you're basically a swing county. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if we group this into swing areas, right? Mm -hmm. So this is swing, this is uh, swing, this is swing, these are swingable, uh, this is actually blue, this is swing. But this is really what you want to pay attention to, right? Mm -hmm. If you this is, the, this is the 5 to 10 percent heading into 20 percent and all back up. You could swing the valley. If you launched, I mean, there's all this talk about getting taxes on the initiative, on the ballot. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is launch naturalization campaigns in Fresno and through the Central Valley, and you could probably swing two assembly seats, two Senate seats, and you could raise taxes without having to put it on the ballot. I don't know, maybe that's important. Um, so we think that this data, uh, while of course we're completely nonpartisan and collected this for 
uh, pure reasons of trying to explore how civic engagement and civic participation could be motivated uh, by the um, increase in the voting population. We think that others who might have, you know, less abstract research interests uh, might find this data useful. Um, so this shows you what would happen. Actually, for this, this data is actually extraordinarily useful just for people who value civic participation. So this is the uh, LPRs who are eligible to nationalize as a share of uh, the eligible population brought down to the Puma level, the public use microdata level. One of the things that, things that you'll see here, which is really interesting, this is basically the gateway cities. These are all the small, inner ring Latino suburbs that are in deep fiscal and political trouble right now. And if you really wanted to increase civic engagement, you would pursue naturalization drives there, because that would actually change civic participation. Uh, this is what it looks like in the Bay Area. Redwood City, right? South San Francisco, etc. cetera. Um, so we think that this data is very important because LPRs, if naturalized, could have a major impact on the voting eligible population. Uh, it's very uh, significant in terms of certain suburbs uh, in these areas, particularly these inner ring suburbs. Uh, and it could have a huge vote, a huge uh, impact on, on votes. Of course, it's more than uh, voting. Uh, this could encourage participation in our civic institutions and facilitate investments in our second generation. And of course, we think that that's uh, very, very important. Uh, so again, California is changing. Uh, California is seen its share of foreign-born fall and a second generation come into being. Nonetheless, this immigrant population remains very important. It remains very important because it's important for the economy. It remains very important because it's the swing vote to get the investments necessary for the second generation to be able to do well. Uh, and we think that paying attention to what the numbers tell us and using this data in some creative ways may actually help to kind of move uh, many different research projects and certainly many different campaigns. Thank you. And uh, well, I mean just that, but Irene Blumrat and I had a student who was looking at Asian American political participation uh, in the state of California by various counties. And she found extremely high rates of naturalization among Asian American ethnic groups and the, one of the lowest voter participation uh, uh, indices or whatever. So just any sort of speculation about what's going on. In other words, naturalization is one thing, but getting people really uh, to participate in electoral politics and also to, to be civically engaged may be quite another thing. Right? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that it's very different for the two major um, populations, right? Because I think that for immigrant Latinos, both the anti-immigrant uh, sentiment of the most recent years has had a very Latinized cast to it, right? So, uh, you know, people feel it as an anti-Latino attack rather than simply an anti-immigrant attack. So there's a, it's a much more uh, animated by the politics of the times. Um, the second thing is that for the immigrant Latino community, uh, it's been able to take advantage of the fact that the union movement has seen its future in immigrant, particularly immigrant mm -hmm. Latino workers, immigrant Asian workers as well, but much more in immigrant Latino workers. And that's meant there's a kind of ready vehicle for mobilization uh, of votes, right? Uh, and so I think that that's really had an impact in terms of explaining the different attachments once people do naturalize it. In fact, you know, it's really one of the most endearing things if uh, if you were hearing, I mean, I did some of that phone calling during the Obama campaign when people were calling to Nevada, and you'd hear people who had just been naturalized who were just eager to vote for the first time uh, about this kind of stuff. And I think that, that's, that was particularly acute in the Latino population. Uh, I do think that for the Asian Pacific Islander population, uh, the interests are more diverse. Uh, there's a sense of becoming citizens for uh, many economic reasons, but not necessarily for the civic participation reasons, maybe participating in kids' education, right? Uh, what's been interesting has been the efforts of Asian Pacific Legal Center and others to try to mobilize and energize uh, that vote. And, and we'll see it kind of a place out in the years to come. Um, I work for an organization that um, advocates <coughs> for the naturalization services program at the state level. And at one point, it was funded at about maybe close to $10 million for the entire state. And then once when the recession hit, it was zeroed out. 
Now it exists in statute, but has zero money at all. So, and, and I know that it's become more difficult to naturalize. It's more expensive. It's um, uh, difficult to pa more difficult to pass the test. So, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you see as some of the challenges for taking advantage of this data, of this information, and of moving forward with naturalization programs that you think would would really, you know, have the kind of impact that your data obviously sh shows the potential. So uh, let me give you one thing and to explain why part of this was in the talk and I just went over it very quick. How many of you have naturalized? Okay. Uh, how much did it cost? I don't recall. Do you? $400. Okay. Was that the only cost? No. No. I mean, both of you, I don't know where, but, but you look, you speak English, both of you speak English, right? And wherever you acquire that, it costs something, right? Uh, generally, anybody who's naturalizing has some legal issues they want to straighten out before they go through the process, right? So that costs money, et cetera, right? And then you have to take some classes on U.S. history, and that's adult ed. So everybody's been focused on, the fee is now 655 Everybody's focused on the sick, oh, we had to get the loans on 655 right? But that's the least of the costs, right? So one of the reasons why this economic put thing we put in, and I didn't linger on it, is important as well. We're trying to do is to create an argument for microloans. And that the microloans would not be 655, but they'd be on the order of six to $8,000 to naturalize. Because literally, you've got to learn English, you've got to take US history, and you really better head in there with a lawyer to straighten out any kinds of things that are kind of maybe either something you did and didn't quite get right, or a family member did and you don't really want to get pulled out in the process, right? So it actually costs quite a bit of money to naturalize, Everybody's been focused on a six fifty five dollar fee, mm -hmm. but they should be focusing on the bigger costs. So uh, Casa de Maryland, which is the immigrant rights organization of Maryland, is working on a microloan program, and we're trying to work with Chile on a microloan program as well. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to figure out how to make the argument that basically banks have to finance this because these folks, and it looks like the people who do like our the estimates I told you the eight to ten percent, those are what are called cross sectional from a cross-section regression, but there's a couple of studies that have done longitudinal, and it looks like that's what happens longitudinally, too. That people are on a trajectory, that if they naturalize, five or six years later, that trajectory is uh, you know, about 8 to 10 percent higher than the trajectory of the people who didn't naturalize, right? who are very similar in the cohort. Right? So we think our snapshot figures are probably close to what would really happen over time, but it happens five to six years from the time you do it. So if you can think about a loan program that says, okay, we're a bank, we're gonna loan you to go through this process. If you go through this process, you pay us back over time because your wages go up. That's a really good intervention. The other thing which I think would be a really good intervention, which a number of us are working on, uh, would be an Office of Immigrant Integration uh, at the uh, state level. That's very similar to what you're talking about, naturalization services, but it would do much broader things around thinking about the whole package of immigrant integration that's there. I'll tell you one story and then I'll shut up so we can get another question. It's always terrible when the, uh, the, the answer goes on and on and on. Uh, questions you didn't even ask about, but I think you should. Uh, so uh, we've been running a council for immigrant integration in uh, Los Angeles. It's paid for by the California Community Foundation. It's their council we just facilitated. And it's brought together business leaders, labor leaders, immigrant rights activists, city planners, uh, multi-cultural, uh, multi, multi-ethnic coalition builders, um, and uh, funders, and then people who do media campaigns. Uh, and the idea is to kind of think about immigrant integration and what kind of stuff we could do to pursue it together. Uh, we, I think it's had both some good direct impacts, which I'll tell you about in a second, and some good ripple impacts in terms of getting people to learn about each other. The first thing we did in our first meeting was to ask people at the first meeting, there were about 30 people, to take someone out to lunch they had never taken, <coughs> never would never talk to. And David Rattray from the LA Chamber of Commerce took out Angelica Salas from the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights. Three years later, the LA Chamber of Commerce came out in favor of the Dream Act. And then last year, when the California Dream Act was up, invited me to speak with the mayor to the chamber about immigrant integration in Los Angeles. 
and the president of the chamber came out in favor of the California Dream Act, which business, by the way, was mostly opposed to because it costs money. It had a fiscal cost, right? But he came out in favor of it, and he basically had us talk about it as a way of sort of softening business opposition, right? Uh, not directly, but just so businesses would understand the importance of immigrant integration. So I think there's a, if you can use this term immigrant integration, it invites in a lot of people who are not the natural allies around immigrant rights, uh, but who see the long-term future of the California economy and society as being wrapped up in how immigrants do. Another question. Well, I've done uh, a lot of qualitative research on the, the quality of the naturalization experience, and, and that I sort of found that there's been, you know, a great deal of bureaucratic inconsistency and institutional discrimination about the process. Any, any sort of, is there any way we can sort of glean that those type of sort of uh, issues through the data, you know, rejection rates perhaps in certain areas, certain offices perhaps have a higher rejection rate or turning people down, turning people away? Anything of that nature? Uh, well, the data we have now wouldn't tell you that, although I think you could get that data and data like that might be available in the future. What we're trying to do is to build a relationship with Office of Immigration Statistics so that um, we can gain access to more data, uh, you know, assuming that we use it in a kind of correct and, and careful way. One thing, the reason why we did this uh, was the first thing I showed you, which is the, we wanted to get at the idea of uh, over and under performers. Because my best guess, how they on if you, does, when we show the over and under performers, everybody goes, yeah. Right? Um, and the reason why is you know what that civic infrastructure is like. You know whether or not the offices in that area are actually amenable, and you also know whether there's immigrant rights infrastructure, right? So when you do a regression analysis, you're bound to get some odd results, right? Uh, many of you know that the joke about statisticians is that a statistician walks into a bar and decides to play a game of darts. Uh, and it's a big game, so uh, he this big bet throws the first dart and it lands like a foot to the left of the bullseye, right? Target. Then he throws the dart, second dart, and it lands about a foot to the right of the target. And he goes, on average, bullseye, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, statisticians tend to like, you know, there can be some weird numbers at the end, right? But if you look at our list of overperformers and underperformers, they totally make sense, right? Uh, the LA offices are more open, right? The Bay Area does a slightly better job, right? Uh, Fresno, don't think so, right? Bakersfield, Hosta, right? Imperial County, it's not set up to do this kind of stuff, right? If you look in the rest of the country, the pattern does not seem to look odd to people who live in the rest of the country. So we think that these, this squares with the notion, I mean, what explains the gap between over uh, predicted performance and actual performance? It's got to be your, the civic infrastructure. So what we're trying to do is to take what we get out of this and couple it with more detailed data from the American Community Survey to see whether or not we can use that uh, as an indirect predictor as well. Um, I was wondering in terms of the um, underperforming you were saying, like the Fresno Madera area, how does language um, kind of fit into that kind of situation, particularly <laughs> since you have a large um, Guadalajara and Purepucha um, kind of community, so the issue of indigenous languages could possibly play into those underperforming um, um, counties. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you do. I also think that you have a more agricultural labor force mm -hmm. that plays in a couple different ways. People may see themselves in a more temporary mm -hmm. situation. Uh, and also uh, places where there's, uh, it changes a little bit, but you know, uh, a lot of the, uh, one of the things you notice when you do, it'd be interesting if anybody else has that when you do qualitative work, and despite all these numbers, I do do qualitative work at times, uh, when you do qualitative work with employers, what you find out, at least in the major urban areas, is that they initially hire like undocumented workers because they think they'll be cheaper. Mm -hmm. Then they go, my God, we need to document these people because they really find that the workers are reliable. They find that the workers have these social networks that pull in new workers mm -hmm. so they can reduce search costs and quality control, right? Mm -hmm. Because nobody's gonna, rec nobody's gonna just recommend their cousin they're going to recommend their cousin that's not going to embarrass them. Many of you have cousins that would embarrass you, right? But you wouldn't recommend them to come to your workplace, right? So, so it, they wind up saying that this is good labor, 
and they wind up losing their interest in a simply exploited labor force. They want an immigrant labor force, but they don't want a simply exploited labor force. This is something, by the way, which is hard generally for left and progressives to understand because we have this, this logic like there's just, they're just there to exploit people, the businesses. But in fact, when they begin to depend on this labor, they become some of the biggest advocates around legalization, around naturalization, et cetera, because they want that labor force to stay. Um, that, I think, is a little different in agriculture, right? Where you want a seasonal labor force, and you may want the folks that are around all year long and have that really tacit knowledge around crops to be able to stay. Uh, but you may not want your kind of migrant labor force to be able to stay. So I think that, that there's a different civic infrastructure on that, that level as well. So on the lang pure language side, which is really what you raised, um, the thing that's interesting about that is to kind of consider uh, the fact that you've got these pretty large indigenous speaking communities in Los Angeles as well. Uh, although those do line up with the under-naturalized areas. Uh, so that may be an important factor. Because that's the gateway cities mm -hmm. and stretching into mid-city. It sounds too that uh, one of your strategies is to reframe the issue, you know, just in the word of integration. And um, I just wonder how that follows philosophically from other framing, you know, yeah. assimilation and things like that. Or how do you envision breaking through those issues? Well, we kind of came to that term. Uh, you're right, it's, it's a term that we think has a very particular meaning, but it's also a very conscious attempt at reframing. Uh, so when we got started, when we started the center, it had two, Center for the Study of Urban Integration, had two kind of origin stories. One was on the campus, there was an initiative, and they, it, they kind of were at a phase where they really wanted to get like a research center out of it. So we asked Alan Myers and I to kind of step in and take over the case. But the second was that I'd been approached by uh, Antonio Mendes, who was head of the California Community Foundation, because it was 2007, I was about to come to SC, and it was June, and you know, there was immigration reform debated <coughs> in Congress, there was a chance that it would pass, right? And she called me and said, you know, comprehensive immigration reform might, might pass in Congress. We have one million undocumented residents in Los Angeles County. We need to have a strategy for how we bring them into the system. And I said, you know, Antonio, this, you know, you're absolutely right, but I'm in the middle of a move. But why don't we talk when I'm down in Los Angeles in August? So I arrived in August, and comprehensive immigration reform, as many of you know, had failed. And Antonio called me and said, you know what? We still have one million undocumented <laughs> you know, and We need to figure out a way how they can work into the system. So for the next year, we did focus groups, uh, and not with the people you'd think, not with immigrant rights activists, although we did that, we did it with labor activists, we did it with uh, city planners, we did it with funders, we did it with people who were used to interacting with community building, and we did it with business leaders. And here's what we found out, it was actually really interesting, then kind of struggle with the immigrant rights activists, who now, by the way, really are into this term. When you say immigrant rights, that resonates uh, with people who that resonates with, right? Because, uh, you know, it resonates because it's based in human rights, right? So that resonates with people who have a Latin American tradition, maybe an Asian tradition, but we don't have a human rights tradition in the United States. We have a civil rights tradition. We don't think people have human rights. We really don't, right? We think you have rights as a citizen, but you don't have rights if you're not a citizen or we wouldn't be able to talk about undocumented people in the way that we do, right? So immigrant rights people believe this is really important, but it doesn't resonate beyond immigrant rights activists. It really doesn't. When you say immigrant integration, uh, it's a little bit like living wage, right? Living wage was hired to fight against, right? What are you gonna fight against? I don't think people should be able to live, right? Uh, if they get a wage, right? That, you, that didn't work. Part of the reason why business lost that fight was how do you fight against the living wage? It was really well framed. Immigrant integration calls on two great traditions in the United States. By the way, both of which are flawed, right? One is that we're a nation of immigrants, right? Well, not really, you know, we're a nation of like, uh, people who were slaves, and Native Americans in the land stolen, and all that kind of stuff too, right? And we're, that we're a nation that's always prided, um, prided itself on in integration. Well, that's not really true either, right? 
But it does resonate, right? So when you say immigrant integration, if you bring people in that you would not normally bring in, the trick is to define immigrant integration in a way that's not about cultural disappearance. And so by using immigrant integration as the economic mobility for, civic participation by, and receiving society openness to immigrants, by making it measurable, by making it objective, by not dealing with the question of assimilation, and by focusing in on what receiving societies need to do, you reframe the issue under a term that's much more familiar to people. So it's been a very conscious, strategic decision to use that term. So I can see why people would argue against it, uh, but I would challenge you to think about whether or not the frame you would use actually widens the tent in a way that moves the middle. And moving the middle is really crucial to changing kind of the politics around immigration in the United States. Um, when you show the graph of uh, the LPR uh, that you said, um, are, are they the people who qualify to become natural citizens? And, uh, and those well, people, um, what do you think is the most pressing problem or need that why they're on natural life? Is it because of economic reasons? Or they just feel comfortable with like <coughs> LPR status? Or they just don't know that you know it's a better uh, choice to you know become a citizen? Well, I have an answer, but I know that you guys do some qualitative work on this, so what do you think are some of the reasons that emerge from your qualitative analysis? And then I'll say what I, what I think emerges too. I think there's been a shift. I mean, I think at one point there certainly was um, uh, an impediment was people sort of, you know, concerns about losing rights in their home country. Um, in the Mexican case, that certainly was an issue. And the Mexican government allows the nationality that frees people up to, to become real citizens. Um, now I think it's safe to say that the broader consensus around citizenship has shifted. People are on board, right? But what's, what's missing is you know, civic infrastructure, and which may or may not guarantee a smooth process throughout the nationalization right, uh, experience. But, and I would follow along with that. Um, I work with the Oaxacan community in Santa Cruz County in LA. And one of the ways that they've been, in terms of kind of civic integration, is they're using these kind of cultural productions. And in conjunction with that, they bring in the Mexican consulate to try to help them get um, the process started. But what's happening is this inconsistency of like, OK, we're going to start your process. People wait in lines for hours, pay $150, and then their cards never come through. And so there's this issue of like people making the effort. But um, there's, uh, there's, there's a problem in San Jose, is specifically to talk about the Bay Area within my own research. Um, and so, I mean, but, but there are efforts. And the consulate has made it very clear that they work a lot with different forms of cultural production. So they're trying to work hand in hand um, with, with any kind of um, events that are organized within the Oaxaqueño community. But it's, it's an issue of that follow through. Like, so I think that you know both what the data would suggest and then what kind of previous history would suggest. If you look at the the if you th think about the fact that Canadians are the least naturalized, right? What it suggests, and then Mexicans are third in line, right? UK second. So what it suggests is that people who think they're going back to their home country have a tendency not to naturalize, right? But the reality of the pattern is that a lot of Mexicans are not going back. Like they perhaps fantasize, right? I mean, so many of you know, mi rancho allá, right? That I would eventually have a little ranch someplace, right? That rancho never comes, right? Because your kids are living on the puente, right? So you're like, <laughs> you know, so the grandkids, and then, you know, like, you know, you're in Mayfair, or okay, say, uh, right? You know, so I think that uh, one of the things that uh, needs to happen really is to communicate too that when people launch an anti immigrant attack in the United States, right? They're not thinking of Canadians, right? It hasn't been like, those damn kids, well, I guess there was that South Park movie, but, <laughs> but they're not really thinking about Canadians. It's, they're, they're, they're thinking about Mexicans, right? Uh, and certain Asian groups, I would argue, too. So I think that one of the things that we really need to convince people of is that if you are eligible to uh, naturalize, it's really almost your obligation. Because by naturalizing, you can protect the rights of immigrants who are not eligible to naturalize. The only people who are going to speak up for undocumented workers with a great ferocity uh, are people who are deeply, I mean, if you look at the, the, the polling data, so many people who come from mixed status families, people who live in situations where there's a lot of undocumented folks, 
uh, wind up being really much more supportive. And the only way we can change the political dynamic is by getting people to nationalize. That's, I think, been the other tension, too, in the immigrant rights community. That people have thought in the past, and I think this has changed, pushing naturalization will take away from immigrant rights, right? If you're pushing naturalization, you're not spending a lot of time defending the undocumented and unique defense, right? I think your best defense is a good offense, right? Get yourself a lot of naturalized people voting and willing to hold politicians accountable around protecting the rights of human rights people in the United States, and then you'll move stuff forward. I mean, we have a police chief in Los Angeles right now mm -hmm. who has, you know, gone along with the whole notion of people who get their cars picked up who don't have driver's licenses. Those cars are going to be held until somebody who has a driver's license can show up and get that car for them, right? That's basically allowing undocumented people to drive in Los Angeles, right? That only happens because of the political force that's there, right? Not just because, well, so I think we really need to change that dynamic as well. That was a dynamic kind of in the immigrant rights community that I think is shifted. Maybe one last point, and then we'll take a break. I was just going to add, as far as the naturalization to what people were saying, is that it, I just remember back to when many community-based organizations were offering people help to naturalize, and legal services, and you know, you'd see signs everywhere in clinics or in places that people would go, and I think part of it is, is that people don't have the time, the energy, you know, to learn the English, to do the history, to pay the money, to just everything piled on. So it, it seems that you know, community-based organizations who have seen themselves underfunded too, I think, to be able to do this work, uh, that that would be an element or a factor that could influence people being able to do it. Because they just, because I, I you know, the micro loans I think is a terrific idea, but even the specter of getting a loan yeah. is scary to people, you know, as opposed to being able to get the service of of going through a class that takes three weeks or four weeks and you're done and you take the test and yeah. And, yeah. Um, so that's how I feel. Like no, I think that makes sense. And again, what we hope is that this, uh, both the, um, both the understanding that certain areas are overperforming and underperforming could help redirect dollars. Because, um, you know, again, I love any dollar that comes into Los Angeles to strengthen the organizations that I work with. Uh, but you could probably get better yield for the buck uh, by directing some of the resources to the areas. I mean, you need to have anchor organizations like the ones that exist in Los Angeles, but what's the ties that we're building to organizations in the Central Valley? What kind of skills and capacities are being put out there, et cetera? So I think you can get a higher yield for the buck in certain areas through exactly the kind of investments you're talking about. And uh, I also think in terms of, you know, again, it does not have to be partisan because I do think that when you find, uh, you know, it, here's an anecdote to really tell you something that's interesting, but, you know, look how Rick Perry got in trouble for basically saying, oh yeah, there's like a lot of undocumented people in Texas, they've been around for a long time. The California Dream Act is a pretty cool, but the, the, not the Dream Act, but in Texas we let them into universities and it would be stupid not to. He just got creamed, right? He got creamed at a national level, right? But that's because he was saying something about Texas, right, that worked in Texas, right? Because in Texas, the population is big enough to punish even a conservative Republican for not taking at least that kind of a position, right? Um, so this idea of making people aware of how large this potential voting electorate is is something that can hold politicians, right, because there's Democrats and Republicans who demagogue this issue, right? hold everybody accountable to having a more civil conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, one last thing on this is, not that I gave it anything to do with it, but the, uh, you never know where a civil conversation is going to emerge, right? So one of the most interesting things in the last two years has been the Utah Compact, right? Which is an agreement amongst business leaders, civic leaders, immigrant rights leaders, religious leaders, to basically have a civil conversation around immigration in Utah. Now, have they done some goofy things as part of it? Sure. Uh, you know, they did, did, did a law that's been really heavy in enforcement, right? But they were also trying to guess, create a Utah guest worker program um, so that people could be in Utah and work without papers. That probably won't fly. But the idea that they're actually even talking about this uh, and they brought business in is really significant. So I think changing our own, those of us who are supportive around immigrant rights, 
uh, thinking about how do we push naturalization, how do we push the economic arguments, and how do we not round up the usual suspects with the unusual allies, I think that's the future.